there's two back here, Oscar. Okay. Executive outcomes went out of business in 1999. And um, a lot of people tend to forget that both executive outcomes and Sandline are now out of business. And the reason for that is because combat, remember I said at the beginning that there is no companies out there anymore. There are no companies that provide combat services. Combat services were too controversial. States were uncomfortable with the idea that there would be entities out there actually buying and selling combat as a service. And so they basically put a stop to the practice. Even in its, what's interesting about that is even in situations where it would be quite useful for somebody to hire a combat company, we haven't seen it happening. Um, and there was a situation in Cote d'Ivoire where a British company offered combat services and basically the Foreign and Commonwealth Office phoned them up and said, forget about it. You want to operate on our shores, you're not doing it. So yeah, it, it's tied in with the disappearance of combat services as so, a viable. So the company is gone, but what gone. happened to the mercenaries? Um, well, remember how I said before, there was a significant degree of overlap. Um, the mercenaries are still working. One of them was Simon Mann. Simon Mann was an employee of Executive Outcomes. And we can see that he, well, until he got put in jail in Equatorial Guinea, was quite active. There is also a significant level of movement. I mean, there are only so many people out there who are attracted to doing this kind of work. A lot of them are perfectly normal, regular soldiers who are doing this to make a bit of extra money. And a lot of them are people who, this has been their livelihood, going from conflict to conflict for a really long time. And that's part of the, the problem, the acute problem in West Africa I was talking about before, is you get a generation of people who may have started out as child soldiers, who all they know how to do is fight wars. And so you'll just carry on doing it. A firefighter needs a fire to Yeah, know. exactly. <laughs> Um, this has to do, I'm, I'm afraid, not with private security companies, but I want to be clear. You said 20,000 to 60,000 mm -hmm. in Iraq now. Does this include the guys that do the laundry that serve the hamburger? No. Okay, that's what I wanted to be sure of. But you've also alluded to the other question that I had yeah. in my mind. It, you said that soldiers can make extra money by yeah. going into these. It's been my impression that it was profitable for them to be there rather than to re-enlist. Yes. And, and on that basis, I would say automatically it's more expensive yes. than, than the regular army or yeah. anything. Well, th their, their answer to that, the company's answer to that claim, which is obviously made quite often, is that they don't have the infrastructure. So if you are the US, not only are you paying for your soldiers, but you're paying for Burger King to be transported to the desert, so they, you know, and all of the facilities, medical facilities, insurance facilities, pensions, um, just so feeding and watering. Eat. Yeah, that's more expensive, <laughs> yeah. No, they do eat, but they don't eat, you know, it's, the infrastructure is not as expensive. So that's where they say the savings is coming from. So there's a question in here, and then there's another slide. Yeah, um, I'm just curious, where, uh, I always start with s some of the uh, outfits like this uh, French and uh, Spanish foreign legion mm -hmm. being quasi mercenaries. Mm -hmm. where, where do you stick those guys in, in, in your <coughs> scheme? Well, I don't consider them to be mercenaries for a couple of reasons. The first is, is that, um, they, they're permanent parts of the French and Spanish armies, so they're, they're, they're part of it. The other thing is, is if you join the French Foreign Legion, you get French citizenship after five years. So it's often a route for people to become French. There are some complicated, the other thing is legally they've never been treated as mercenaries. Even in stages of time when mercenaries were very common, so the 19th century for example, the French Foreign Legion and the Spanish Foreign Legion were both considered to be exceptions that they weren't considered to be mercenaries. We actually have a very long tradition of foreigners serving in armies and not considering them to be mercenaries. And we have lots of exchanges of troops, for example, where a NATO soldier might go serve in, a British NATO soldier might go serve in Washington under the Pentagon. So th th it's kind of a normal thing to have foreigners as permanent parts of your, of your armed services. Yeah, but it's, but, but it's not normal to have specific units within a military organization. Well, it's no longer normal. It's no longer normal. Currently. Yeah. But it used to be extremely normal. And there was always a distinction drawn in the 19th century between those foreign units, which were considered kind of OK, and guys who had their own mercenaries, bands of mercenaries who were roaming around who you could hire. So that part of the distinction I draw is historical. But they're an interesting, they're a very interesting phenomenon. In fact, it's very interesting that they both still exist in quite large numbers. People tend to forget about them. Some of the advantages of using mercenaries that you talked about also applies to using the French Foreign Legion. Mm, except for the fact the French Foreign Legion are permanent. So, and they, they're subject to all of the same laws. So France can't send the Foreign Legion to do something that it also wouldn't send the French Army to do. And the same rules apply to its deployment. 
So it really is just a regular part of the French army. It just happens that the people who are employed by it are foreigners. I was wondering if you could speak a bit more about resistance to regulation, mm -hmm. particularly among the executive branches of government. Yes. And, and maybe what happens when, if there's a kind of a tension between the military in the field, mm -hmm. these private security firms, and executive power, and mm -hmm. how that all gets negotiated. Well, one of the things which is, I think, certainly an issue in the UK, and remember I said the Ministry of Defense doesn't want to touch this with the 20-foot pole. I think that's part of the reason why commanders are very unhappy, military commanders in Iraq are very unhappy about private security companies, almost without exception. Um, they, they, they feel very much like these companies are undermining the regular mission. They feel very much as though these companies aren't quite under control and they have a great deal of discomfort with some of the things that the companies are allowed to do. And military interrogation is the thing that people are most uncomfortable, tend to be most uncomfortable about. <coughs> and it's also partly that the military in the US and the UK are now losing the capacity to do a whole bunch of things themselves. So there is now a generation of soldiers which no longer knows how to do military interrogation coming up because that's been privatized. And the longer it stays privatized, the more that skill will be lost. So if the US ever decides that it wants the military to do it again, it's going to have to retrain all of the people to do it. So th there's definitely a tension between what the military wants and what the executive branch is giving. I think in the US case, the complexities of the war in Iraq have definitely increased a certain intransigence about regulation. There's no question that, that greater regulation needs to happen. And one of the things which has been quite cool is since the Democrats took over Congress, there have been at least two congressional in initiatives to introduce further regulation, one of which looks quite serious and may, something may actually come of it. So I think that, 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 as I say, the unpopularity of the war in Iraq and President Bush's position with the war made the US system more complicated. In the UK, it, it is fascinating to me that it, it does seem to be squabbling among the different branches of government. Most people seem to think that regulation is, is quite a good thing. But because most of the UK companies aren't actually employed by the UK, they tend to be employed by the US, it's also slightly less pressing. So most of the big US companies have contracts with the Americans. They don't necessarily, UK companies rather have contracts with the Americans. They, when they provide services for the British government, it tends to fall into the pretty non-controversial basket. So it tends to be things like um, embassy security in Kenya, which you know people aren't so worried about. There are two uh, four <coughs> questions. So gentlemen back there, you, and then I'll come back to you. Uh, my question is about the US and the ICC. Mm -hmm. you, you did mention that the US is not signature to the Euro yeah. statute. But when I was in my doing my undergraduate days, we talked about the bilateral immunity arrangement. I don't know if it's still in place because I haven't followed up on it, but mm. is it possible that that would also be an impediment to putting in place a farm legal mechanism for this problem? Yes, and when I talked about the Military Extraterritorial extra Jurisdiction Act, one of the things that I didn't mention is that contractors in Iraq, and in fact all US forces in Iraq, were specifically immunized from local prosecution. And this is a very common arrangement which happens, and part of the rationale for it is that it prevents soldiers who are caught doing something bad from being tried in a country whose judicial system may not be all that great. So people will say it prevents kangaroo court trials. What it results in is no trials, <laughs> which may be worse than a kangaroo court trial. But yet, there, bilateral immunity um, and immunity from prosecution in the context of war is a very common tool, and it's a tool which has had a specific impact on this industry. Yeah? Well, in the case of the ICC, oh, yeah. no, 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 no. But in the case of the ICC, the last time I checked, they had mm. close to one third of the countries that were signatures to the Rome Statute yep. signing the PIA with the U.S. With the U.S. Wouldn't that be a problem in the long run? It might be. I mean, the problem with the the problem with the applicability of the International Criminal Court to these crimes is that it hasn't actually proved itself to be a particularly robust institution yet, anyway. So even even despite the presence of of specific agreements, bilateral agreements, there is a question as to whether or not. The crimes that you must commit to be brought before the international court have been so major that it's probably it's too big a stick in some cases to deal with what we have happening in Iraq. Um, yeah, I got two questions. First off, it, by being so taboo about having combat forces as part of private mercenaries and having government soldiers like very critical of it, are you not just driving 
the, the same product just into the underground. Yeah. And so you're not going to have any more, you'll have less control of the system, but it's still going to be there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And second of all, if you use, um, if you were talking about how the ground forces now interact, they're not, they're not showing up anymore, right? They're just sort of sticking their feet in the mud, they're sort of dragging themselves mm -hmm. into it, right? That's the private, private forces. Yeah. So how, if you wanted them to, how would you get them to provide their services okay. any more steadily? Because if they're a private company, they buy private forces cost benefits. They're not going to want to show up and, you know, if they sign a contract and they can't get out of the contract, yeah. they're not going to provide the service. Yeah. Well, in, in the first, in relation to your first point, the point about is this just driving the industry underground? Yeah. It is, and that's one of the problems with domestic regulation in the industry when I talked about regulation of the willing, is that we're only regulating people who want to be regulated. And there's always going to be a black market for this kind of thing out there. There are always going to be people who want to run a coup and they want to hire people to have their coup for them. And that's never going to go away, which is part of the reason why I think companion legislation dealing specifically with mercenaries is necessary. The other, um, in, and your second question about contractors not showing up, it's very difficult to govern this sort of thing by contract. So let's imagine you're a government contractor and, and what you want is someone to come build the building for you. You can say the building needs to be this big, it needs to have this many windows, you know, you specify everything. And the contracts, the ones, the very few that we've seen, are very similar. You know, you will do this job, you will undertake these activities. And what's happened is the companies, if something comes up new, they'll say, no, you know, that's not, point two, point two of our contract says we don't have to do that, or that's not in the contract at all. So part of it is devising better contracts, and that's difficult to do when you've fired most of your contracting personnel, which is what happens in the US. They, the con they don't have enough professionals to write really good contracts. There, I have a couple of colleagues who are lawyers who work on this, and they are looking specifically at this contractual element, how can we make better contracts to deal with the industry? But no matter what, because, because there, we're gonna take two more questions she is speaking again, <laughs> so she needs some sustenance in between. <laughs> so, and I invite you to come to the seminar yeah, and talk. So, last two questions. Please. Just a quick question. You mentioned uh, bar associations, medical associations. Yep. What really comes to my mind is uh, engineering professional associations, yep. which have a lot more have had a lot more experience with overseas contracts. Have yep. you looked into uh, the impact of those legislations on their overseas work before? No, that's an interesting point. I haven't partly because. Um, we tend not to worry about engineers making malpractice mistakes in the same way that we worry about uh, about doctors and lawyers doing it. But it would be a really interesting model because of the overseas thing. Uh, That's a good point. Yeah, just seeing because they have engineers exactly. have to work more overseas than say lawyers have. So I yeah, think there might be more examples. Yeah, that. that's a really good point. Thanks. Last question, Andy. Okay. <coughs> Since the end of the Cold War, we see, we see the change in the nature of conflicts uh, increase the number of, sort of what we call complex humanitarian emergencies. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the utilization of so called civic rights, mm -hmm. military cooperation, in those kinds yeah. of cases, that tends to blur the lines sometimes between the military operation and civilian mm -hmm. operation. Have you looked at uh, the extent to which private military or private security companies uh, are getting themselves involved in these kinds of civic operations? And, and, and I'm, I'm thinking about Black Water yeah. and, and their role in, uh, in Iraq right now. Yeah. Well, <coughs> Less, it's actually less in Iraq. One of the things about the, the gentleman at the back who asked about why about the disappearance of executive outcomes, companies have seen the writing on the wall a little bit, and the first thing they did was they stopped providing combat, and the second thing they did is said, well, we're unlikely to have another Iraq again, so where is our business going to come from? And a lot of them are looking exactly at this industry about the provision of humanitarian aid, protection of humanitarian aid, and in some cases actually getting involved in doing it themselves. So how, providing human rights training to help companies meet the standards of the UN Voluntary Code of Conduct. So it's a real growth area for the industry. It's occurring already in that most, most NGOs, the UN and a lot of other organizations that do humanitarian work have to hire private security now because some of the war zones in which they operate are so dangerous that it would not be possible. And they're so uncomfortable about doing it. I have a friend who started doing a PhD and he was going to look at this issue and he had to stop because no one would talk to him on the record about it because they were so embarrassed by using private security, partly because of the complexities, humanitarians not being comfortable with engaging in military force generally, but also partly because they didn't want the word mercenary anywhere near them. Uh, many of you had um, questions and I am sorry uh, we aren't able to take them to, uh, 
present, but I hope you will come to the 7.30 talk. But I would like for you to join me, please, in thanking Dr. Sarah Percy for a really interesting talk. And again, uh, 7.30, and I really appreciate that she's doing this double performance. <laughs>